Good morning. Joining me today is Jo Goodhue, a minister in the national-led government of New Zealand. She represents the electorate of Rangitata, which, for those who don't know, is located in the South Island. Minister Goodhue has been a member of Parliament since 2005, and her ministerial portfolios include women's affairs, senior citizens, and the community and voluntary sector. She's also the Associate Health and Associate Primary Industries Minister, and if you know anything about New Zealand, primary industries are paramount. Minister, thank you so much for taking the time to come talk with us today. Um, we are especially grateful right now because this month you and the Ministry of Women's Affairs are incredibly busy with events to commemorate the 120th anniversary of New Zealand granting women suffrage. Now, in America, we are very aware of the decades-long campaign for votes for women, which culminated for us in the 19th Amendment to our Constitution. So I would be very interested to know, Minister, what elements in New Zealand society and politics you believe were instrumental in making that historic decision in 1893? Well, there were a number of elements which I will try and cover off. But firstly, thank you so much, Dorothy, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I think we're, we're actually celebrating two very significant events right now. And I'd like to acknowledge that no, not only is it 120 years since uh, women were given the vote is how some people put it and I'll, I'll move on to that in a moment um, but also it's we can commemorate in fact the visit by your first lady Eleanor Roosevelt 70 years ago and what an impression she left on New Zealanders wearing her Red Cross uniform and talking about um, wanting to communicate to New Zealand families, in particular to New Zealand women, um, her thanks on behalf of the soldiers and in fact the women of America who appreciated New Zealand women opening their homes and their arms to, to the soldiers that she in fact were coming, she was coming to visit. So I just want to acknowledge that as well. I know it's a very special time for you. Thank you. So the, the elements that, that really contributed to suffrage, um, Kate Shepherd led a dedicated band of, um, of suffragists who really wanted to achieve equality for men and women. They believed that women should be able to vote and they didn't give it a year of their lives, they gave it many years of their lives. So it, I understand at one time there were women chained to the um, gates of parliament making their point. Uh, what they did was they went around the country, um, they had meetings that for the first time saw a woman take the stage and say what this was all about. And in every significant population area, in many cases they were travelling around the country on horseback. So this was not this was not the era of catching a train, um, you know, a, spe a speedy train from place to place. Um, it wasn't easy for them, and they also were knocked back time and time again. But the other element, it wasn't just their dedication to the cause. The other element that I want to mention, and I'm going to read you some names of sig some significant men, some politicians that I believe played a very important part in actually getting this over the line because it could not have happened without men agreeing that it was the right thing to do. And those leading male politicians include John Hall, Robert Stout, Julius Vogel, William Fox and John Balance. They supported women's suffrage. So those elements are true today in women's fight for equality. We can't do it without the support of the men folk who believe in it as well. Um, interesting, the themes just continue across the ages. Very little has changed. It's That's very right. True. Um, as you did note, concurrently with your commemoration, we are celebrating uh, the 70th anniversary of the visit by First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, the ambassador has been giving some remarks around the country, and he points out that in her tour of the Pacific, she actually met 400,000 people. I mean, that's just an absolutely mm -hmm. astounding number. Um, she is still today cited as a hero to young men and women for her work with the United Nations, uh, her volunteerism with the Red Cross, as you mentioned, her work on civil rights, and of course her, her ability to redefine the role uh, as First Lady. She was somebody who publicly challenged her husband on his policies, which was, it was not done uh, in the 1940s. So our ambassador has been um, posting a blog that puts mm. up Eleanor Roosevelt's daily diary from her time here in New Zealand, and it's, it's quite fascinating. Uh, and there's a quote there uh, that I'd like to read to you, as you mentioned, uh, in terms of timeless connection 
from 70 years ago or 120 years ago to today. And the quote is, this is a period when women are doing new things in many places, sometimes from sheer necessity, sometimes because they have long wanted to do something different, but conventionalities held them back. Now the world is a freer world, and those with capacity, whether men and women, are in demand. And this, this is uh, incredibly relevant today, and so I would be really interested in your thoughts on the particular challenges facing these, if I may, women with capacity today, the demand for them, and how they meet that demand. I'm going to start off by again referring to a list, because I think this sets us up for where we are now. Not only did Eleanor Roosevelt, as your First Lady, show that she had to break the mould of what was expected of a First Lady, but there were others that broke the mould as well. And I just want to refer to, in 1896, Emily Seidberg was the first woman to graduate as a doctor. Then in 1894, Elizabeth Yates was the first female mayor anywhere in the British Empire. In 1949, Iraka Vatana became the first Māori woman member of parliament. And in 1997, we're very proud that the Right Honourable Dame Jenny Shipley was the first woman Prime Minister. And in fact, half of my electorate was Dame Jenny's electorate as well. So I feel a really right. special connection there. But what happened when we had these wonderful people lead the way, as with Kate and New Zealand leading the way with the vote, and many other notable women in our past, is there was a sense of we've done it. Yes. We're yes. there now. Wrong. Mm. We're nowhere near where we need to be. And that's why my priorities through my Ministry of Women's Affairs uh, portfolio are to actually have more women in leadership positions because currently um, women's schools are not um, used to the fullest of New Zealand's potential mm -hmm. or their potential either. So we've worked to do there. Women's, in, increasing women's economic independence will help address what we have at, in, in the, at the current moment, a gender pay gap. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact mean better lives for those women and their families. And in addition, sadly, women are overrepresented in the statistics relating to violence. Yeah. So those are my three priorities. So I think that's the challenge for us. What can we do to continue to work on those three areas? Now, we've set a very challenging target for women in um, governance roles in the state sector. That target is 45%. And it's jolly hard. There are many countries around the world who will set a target of at least 40% of both genders in those roles. We've actually set ourselves a challenging target, and we're finding it very hard to get there. But we know there are women out in New Zealand, in all parts of the country, with the necessary skills to do it. We just need their CVs where they need to be at the right time. And then we have the issues of economic independence. And for some, it is economic independence from lives where they are, um, they have very little money. And then there are those who simply are missing out on the opportunity to be much more economically independent. So, uh, and I want to mention one thing in particular, negotiation. Oh, Women yes. do not <laughs> negotiate wages. Um, and so what we know from looking at studies is that because right from the word go, a woman or men are four times more likely to actually negotiate their starting salary or any salary, yes. um, women are potentially missing out on about a half a million dollars worth of difference for doing the same over job. A, over a career, yes. It's not, it, it's not right but at the same time, it's not instinctive for women to do that. So how can we change that? How can we influence the unconscious bias that sees women falling out of the pipeline for all sorts of reasons? Um, how can we show that, in fact, time served is not the reason for promotion and increase in salaries and wages, that it's about skills? And it doesn't necessarily follow that if you take time out for maternity leave, that your skills disappear, or that they, they take a hike, or they're stunted or something. Um, but in fact, we're seeing some amazing companies who understand what unconscious bias is, and they're willing to work to identify it, to shine a light on it, hold up the mirror to those who don't even understand that they have it. And you know, in, in the course of understanding it myself, I've, I've discovered I have unconscious bias too, probably like all New Zealanders. 
And then lastly, women's safety from violence. Well, that's a tough one, a really tough one. So where the Ministry of Women's Affairs are dedicating their energies is to look at re-victimisation, to look at okay. preventing re-victimisation. They've done some work in this area. They're sharing across government ways in which, um, again, we can shine the light on what that means and look at any way we can actually prevent it happening to women because the statistics are alarming. And, and that work that you're doing in preventing violence against women is another aspect where it's very important to have both genders working together to address the mm. issue. I think there's a concept that the Ministry of Women's Affairs would then work only with the women on these issues, but that's definitely not the case, correct? If we leave 49% of the population <laughs> thinking there's not a problem, that's then true. we won't actually solve any of this. And, and what we are seeing more and more of is champions for change. And uh, amongst our men folk, they totally understand. And you know, if you want to put it in the boldest of terms, if the bottom line is going to be better off, if and we utilise women's skills, that 51% of the population, their skills fully, New Zealand Inc. will be better off. Our families will be better off. The individuals themselves will be better off. Um, so it really isn't just um, a good thing to do, it's the right thing to do. Thank you. I mean, it, it's you. You have, uh, in your role as minister, have presented at the United Nations uh, on the under the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW. Uh, and as New Zealand, your reputation tends to be excellent as a country. As you mentioned, uh, you've had two female prime ministers, female governor generals, female heads of the Supreme Court. Mm, exactly. how, how do you? What is your answer to that? To that assumption? that New Zealand, much like, uh, uh, for example, a Finland or a Sweden, doesn't have the same level of gender issues. How, how do you address or respond to that, that question? It's true. We don't have the same level of gender issues as some countries do. But are we there yet? Absolutely no. not. There's a long way to go yet. And actually, women deserve us to keep trying. But I think there is, um, I think sometimes there's a sense of compact. Uh, complacency mm -hmm. does creep yes. in and it's about finding new ways to energize change new ways of actually shining a light on the sort of things that are happening without people even realizing they're happening um, and it does take a lot of driving you know um, mm. and and woman you know you, oh, maybe I shouldn't generalize but I'm going to anyway right. women Please. do hold back um, they assume that their skills, because they know they've got them, will get them where they need to go. Um, actually, a man with the same skills will take a different approach. There's not, neither a right or wrong, they're just different. They're inherent. In the same extent. way as you put a woman into a team out in the field, and we've seen evidence of it, where they'll be working on a contract, maybe something to do with the um, electrical supply industry. They might be cable jointers, and we've heard examples of this. They add a different risk perspective to the mix that makes them very valuable team yes, members. Yes. They just think differently. And it's the same diversity around a board table, which doesn't need to be just gender diversity, but age diversity, um, people who are differently abled, ethnic diversity mm. as well, brings better results in the decision making. And actually, we just have to keep on selling that story, showing the evidence for that story, if we're actually going to continue to be a world leader and take our rightful place as a, as a country that values and makes the best of the resources we have in our men and our women. I, I think you've made the point a couple of times, you shine a light in the dark corners that you may not realize were there. Um, Minister, if I may ask a more personal question, uh, I think you have a very interesting backstory because you have not been in politics your whole life. Uh, you, as somebody who's balanced family and a career, uh, your background is in medicine. You were, I believe, a registered nurse. So that may seem a bit of a distance from work in politics. Mm -hmm. So how did you make that transition? And on a more personal level, did you find that there were mentors that assisted you in either profession that helped you achieve what you have achieved in your life? To tell you the truth, the best support I've always had has been from my family. So I, I trained as a nurse after I left, um, left high school and my nursing training, I sort of fell into it almost by accident, it wasn't a grand design, but it was a 
fabulous career to be in. It taught me many things about communication, about working with people that I've continued to use every day of my political life. Um, in fact, I have to say the, the most important learning I ever did was actually when I was still at school, I did a, um, a training to be a, a youth line counsellor and it was in communication and listening. And, in, and, and to tell you the truth, if you can take that into life, um, you'll be well served by remembering how to listen. And so I grew up in a, a relatively politically aware family. I'm sure that helped me to, to sort of think that politic, politics was a possibility. Um, I was involved in lots of community organisations, invariably finding myself as the president or the chairperson or something. <laughs> it, it happened, and, and you, you become a spokesperson. I left nursing and went into crime prevention and again found myself in spokesperson type roles. And people were starting to say to me, why don't you stand for council? Now this is the local government aspect yes. of it. I knew the portfolios that interested me weren't local government portfolios. And so I said no, thank you very much. Um, but at the same time, people around me had started to understand that I was interested in central government politics. But I had to get myself selected. And that's where I encountered some interesting questions by, um, that were posed to me by those who would select me. Like, who will cook for your family? <laughs> and how will you juggle um, being in politics and being in Wellington all the time? And so I did right from the word go what I felt I owed to my family. They, their support was absolutely integral to the decision to become a politician. Sat down with, the, with our three daughters, my husband Mark is fantastically supportive and a far better cook than me, so that was an easy answer right, so that, that one. That was my husband, so there you it go. It does help a lot. <laughs> And um, sat down with our three daughters, all teenagers at that time, and said to them, so if I decided to get into politics, what would worry you about that? And they said, but you'd be away all week, Mum. You'd be in Wellington for five days of the week and we might see you at weekends or we might be away rowing or something at weekends. And so I was able to explain to them that the reality was I would spend three days and two nights of the yes. week in Wellington for about 30 or 31 weeks of the year. And they said, oh... That's not a problem then. That's fine. So again, it's about shining a light on the facts so that you can get in, in your head what you're up against. I must say that cell phones are extremely helpful in this day and age for politicians keeping in touch with their, their kids. And we, from the word go, would keep in touch daily by cell phone, by text, or I'd try and talk to the family every day and still do to my husband. The children are now at university. They have less ah. need to be... Um, they would like a little more space, constant. I would imagine. Oh, but occasionally I get a message by text saying, would you like to ring now? Oh. Which I know is they feel like a chat with their mum. So, and I mean, I would occasionally get a text from them and I would find they're watching Parliament TV. I mean, I'm not sure why. Maybe the homework wasn't much fun on those nights. But, Who um, doesn't enjoy a good bout of Parliament TV? Uh, <laughs> on one occasion, I, it was suggested to me by one daughter that I tell the the colleague who'd just sat down, that he shouldn't laugh at his own jokes. So they were fully engaged in supporting me, which I, was a great gift, a, a huge gift. And I think that any woman who wants to juggle career and family life, it has to be all in together, yes. in my view, because if things aren't going well at home, they won't be going well at work either. Well, I, th I think you are most definitely an excellent role model for your daughters. Um, I can only imagine where they'll go from here. <laughs> Probably not into politics. Probably not into <laughs> politics, but never say never. Um, Minister, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And I do wish you a very successful and very full suffrage month. Um, I, it sounds like you've got quite a lot of work on your plate, but it's all good work. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dorothy, for the opportunity to be here today. And you're right, it's going to be a very exciting month. And um, I remember the 100th celebration as well and, and white gardens and, 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 as you know, murals that sprang yes. up around the country. I think the 120th celebration is going to be very special as well. Excellent. Thank, thank you, you very much.